I really wrestled with this, and I hope I got it right. <laughs> um, this church is different than most traditional churches in this part of the world. Churches that have done a great work, and thank God they're there. But God didn't send us here to be like everybody else. He sent us here to be what he wants us to be. There was something that he wanted to do here. And I can see, and I won't go into all of it, but this church has had an impact. There are several other churches this morning that they got their training here. They were sent out of here. So we're not just preaching here this morning. Amen. We're preaching and teaching in other places as well. And there's a reason for that. Because that's not really common. And I can tell you this. When God sent us here, he sent us into a very, very, very religious area where religion rules and reigns. To be here in this house means you're different. Not everybody's here. There's a there's a there's a hundred churches in this in this county. Mm -hmm. A county of I don't know how many, maybe twenty thousand now. Used to be about sixteen thousand last time I heard. But uh, that's why I need to teach on this. For some of you, you're going to say, "Well, I've heard that before." But for some of you, you're going to say, I never heard that. And you need to hear it because you need to know what kind of church you're in. You need to know who's ministering to you and what gift is he has to minister to you. It will help you. And it will give you the answer when people ask you questions like, what kind of church do you attend? Well, most people are going to say Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Church of God, Assembly of God, Congregational Holiness, Pentecostal Holiness, and so forth and so on. But this church doesn't fit any of that. Okay? And, 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 it, and if God wanted us to be like everybody else, there wouldn't be no need for us. Okay? So I'm going to talk to you this morning about apostles and the apostolic church. Is that okay? Okay. In 2 Peter 1, 13, it says, Yea, I think it meet, or I think it's right, as long as I am in this tabernacle, that is, Peter saying, as long as I'm in this body, as long as I am on this planet, I think it meet to stir, up your, stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Now, why do we need to be put in remembrance? Because we forget. Second Peter, Peter 3, 1 says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance. Remembrance. Do you know that if you distance yourself from something, you can forget it? You can forget about it. Yeah. That's why, that's why the Word of God has to be Repeated. Did you know that Kenneth Hagin, his ministry went all over the world. He started a movement that is still going today. He sowed his life into many, many, many sons and daughters. And even though he's gone to heaven, there, he's still even writing books. <laughs> he's in heaven writing books. What do I mean by that? They take his messages, they take his teaching, even after he's gone, and they put it in book form. Right. Amen. So the message that God sent him to this nation and to the world to minister was the message of faith. We call it the word of faith. Okay. Now, some of you have heard this. February the 6th, 2000, year 2000. 
I was fasting. Matter of fact, I was finishing up a seven-day fast. And I woke up that morning. After breaking the fast, I woke up. And God has dealt with me this way several times. But it's, and, and I've had the experience many times, but it's not necessarily God. Not every dream is of God. How many knows that's true? I can go yet a step further. Not every vision is of God. Amen. You can see things in your mind's eye, and it, it, it's not God necessarily. But I, in this, in this uh, vision or this dream vision or vision dream, I was in a church. I know what church it was. And I was sitting on the platform, and it was my time to minister. And so the, the minister of the house called me up, and I opened my Bible, and uh, I began to read, and all of a sudden I realized that I had my hat on. Now, I don't minister with a hat on usually, and I was somewhat embarrassed. And the reason I knew I had my hat on is because the light from above was just like my hand. I can see the shadow of it on the Bible right there. And I could see the shadow of the hat on my Bible, and I was embarrassed, and so I took it off. I started to read again. And I looked down, and there's that shadow again. I had another hat on. I took it off. Well, this happened several times, and I woke up. I came out of that twilight zone. It's right between when you're waking up and when you're sound asleep. You don't know whether to call it a dream or a vision, but it's in what I call the twilight zone, when you're waking up. And I came to the, this, my study, and I was praying about it what this could mean. And this is, uh, this is what the Holy Spirit revealed to me. He said, uh, you have received and accepted church the way it was passed down to you. In other words, you've accepted church. I, people get born again in the church. Well, if you get born again, you were a sinner before then, and you don't know anything about the church. So whatever they teach you is what you believe. Because after all, you're a baby, and they know more than you do, so I accept that as a truth. Well, he said, you have accepted church the way it was handed to you. I don't know if you realize this or not, but for the last 2,000 years, there's, diff there's been different moves of God, and church has changed over those years. Well, who's to say that we got it right this time? Hello out there. And so he said, uh, you've accepted church the way it was passed down to you. Then he went on to say, he said that you, uh, the New Testament uh, church, the pattern for it is found in the New Testament. Whoever thought. So if we want to find out what the church is really supposed to be like, you have to go to the New Testament and find out what church was like. Hello? And if you do that, this is what you're going to find. What we know as church today, basically and traditionally, is not the church of the New Testament. It's not. It's not. And we'll, we'll prove this to you. So... <clears throat> After he showed me that, and he showed me that these hats were layers of religion. How many knows you can have religious thinking? How many knows you can have religion and not know Jesus? So he told me, and so when these, 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 these hats represented what I had accepted in my mind to be truth. Okay, it was, it was, it was just religious thinking. And then, this is where it gets interesting. Then he dealt with me and helped me to see that I was an apostle. And that's a scariest word in religious circles. They have literally written 
articles about me saying, now this is not just in the Franklin County City, this is the Anderson Independent. It's got thousands of uh, readers. And this guy just down the road here heard somebody talking about me being an apostle. And so he wrote an article about me, and he didn't call my name, but he said, for the audacity of anybody to call themselves an apostle today is, is ridiculous. And before the article was over, he was contradicting himself. <laughs> Religion will make a fool out of you. Now, what is an apostle? The word or the title apostle was common and secular in Jesus' day. In other words, it was a word that later became part of the doctrine of, of, of the Bible, of the New Testament. But to begin with, it was just a common word that was used, and it was used in this manner. An apostle, follow me here, an apostle was one who was sent by a, a, a government of another nation sent over to another nation to conquer that nation and to make that nation just like the nation that sent him. Right. That's, uh, it's like, uh, uh, I guess you would call it a general, somebody that's overseeing the army. And by the way, they had to have an army with them. All apostles have somebody, I mean, uh, you can't be a leader unless you got somebody following. Hello? I know this deep. But that person was called an apostle. The admiral of a ship was called an apostle. It is a person that invades. They go into a new territory. They invade that territory. They're the leader of an army. Let me tell you this. You ever heard me talk about when I came back from Bible school and stepped off the running board of that truck? All of a sudden, I felt all this pressure. I felt these demonic forces coming against me. You remember that? Yeah. Why? Because I'm invading. I'm invading. I'm coming in here to do something that hasn't been done before. Right. To have a, a government that has been done before. To have a, 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 a ministry that hasn't been done before. To have music that hasn't been done before. Apostles always go first. I'll read it to you in just a minute. But I was the first one here. I came here. God sent me. I didn't know it at the time. had no idea. No wonder the devil fought me. I came here as an invader. I came here to conquer. That's what an apostle did in that day. They went into another nation to conquer that nation to de dethrone the powers and the force that ruled that nation. Is any of this beginning to fit anything that you might be thinking about? Does that sound like anything familiar to you? To invade, to conquer, that means there's going to be a war. Boy, it's quiet in this church. That means there's going to be a war because the ruling powers are going to be confronted. Number three, they're there to occupy. To take that conquered nation and teach them the customs, the traditions, the value, even the language. Why do you think that the New Testament was written in Greek? Could I tell you, it was because Greece, led by Alexander the Great, had invaded Rome, the, actually the known, known world, and had established the culture of Greece and m taught the people the language of Greece. That's why the New Testament is written in Greek. 
Does that make sense to you? Because, see, here again, we're talking about colonization. We're talking about one nation conquering another nation and attempting to make that nation just like the nation that sent them. Well, we're here sent by God, amen, to change a culture from a secular culture to the kingdom of God, to establish kingdom culture. Hello? Now, here's where people, this is a part religion doesn't accept and they don't understand. There's four, listen, there's four levels or four ranks of apostles. Number one, Hebrew 3, 1, says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, the apostle and a high priest of our profession. Nobody is like Jesus. But Jesus was a sent one. Go to the New Testament, go to the four Gospels and see how many times Jesus himself said, the Father has sent me. Because listen, the word apostle means a sent one. It comes from the Greek word apostolos. It means one who is sent. Like you have to be sent to be an apostle. You can't just go do what you want to do, or you can't just look over here and say, "Boy, this place needs a this place needs a needs a church." I believe I'll start one. Right. Nobody is preaching the, the word. Nobody, I'm, I'm, or I'm going to split from this church. And I'm going to go over here and start another church. That is not the biblical way that a church is to begin. It always starts with an apostle. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, was started by an apostle, the apostle, and his name was Jesus. He is the head of the church. The second rank of apostles were the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Those 12 men that walked with Jesus, that saw his miracles, that accepted his teaching, this is the same group that even after he went to heaven, they turned the world upside down. Amen with their preaching. Nobody can ever say that they are one of the apostles of the Lamb. But that's all people know. When they think about an apostle, they think about the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Nobody can do that because nobody has walked with Jesus and saw, seen his miracles in the, in the body, in the physical body. Nobody. So nobody is claiming to be uh, an, an apostle of the Lamb. If they do, they're crazy. Number three. Number three is the foundational apostles. These are the apostles that wrote scripture and taught that, uh, that the doctrine, amen, of Christ. They established the foundational uh, doctrine that we all know and live by today and understand to be true. Well, there's no foundational prof apostles today because nobody is authorized Nobody to write scripture. Paul was a foundational apostle. Now, in, in Acts chapter 13, we'll start in verse 1. Are we okay? Are we doing all right? See, I don't have Ann and Vicky here to egg me on. T and Vanessa left me, and I thought, what am I going to do? And then uh, Ann and Vicky took his place, and they do a good job. But y'all going to have to make up for their absence today. So <laughs> Acts 13, uh, 1 through 4. Now there were in the church which was at Antioch certain uh, prophets and teachers, such as Bar we'll name six men. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, watch this, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul. Now, Barnabas and Saul at this time was either a prophet or a teacher or both. You, you, you see that? There were certain teachers and prophets in the church at Antioch. So they had to be one or the other. Amen. 
for the separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent. They became sent ones. And what's this? They sent them away. Who did? The elders of the church, the prophets and the teachers. They sent them away. Everybody say sent. So they being sent by the Holy Ghost, separated, excuse me, departed in Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. He said they were sent by the Presbyterian, and they were sent by Holy Ghost. After that, they were called apostles because now they've been sent. They've been sent by the church. Notice the Holy Ghost said, been sent by the church, by eldership, and by the Holy Ghost. To be an apostle, you will have to be sent by the Holy Ghost, amen, and the Presbytery. Hello? And so, <clears throat> Ephesians 2.20, I'm talking about Paul being a foundational apostle. Let me tell you why he is a pattern of the New Testament apostle. Well, I can't tell you right yet. Ephesians 2.20 says, and, built, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay? Here's the fourth level. This fourth level, these are the apostles we have today. And I don't know of uh, maybe... Personally, I know there's many, many, many more. But personally, I only know maybe of a couple other apostles beside myself. And they are found, listen, these are different, these are different kinds of apostles. Amen. And let me, let, me, let me read you this. Now, when you read the book of Ephesians, it starts off by saying, to the church at Ephesus. Well, we don't live in Ephesus. But it was Paul's flagship church. In other words, this was the highest level of church that he ever started. Okay. And it is to the church and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So that includes us, doesn't it? Okay. So this is what Jesus, or excuse me, what Paul said. Now listen. Paul is a foundational apostle. And in the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, it's in the eighth verse, it says, Wherefore he saith, that's talking about Jesus, when, everybody say when. Amen. Because, see, there's two words in this passage that unlocks the door to the apostolic as we know it today. Two words. Everybody say when. Amen. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? So he's talking about Jesus. When he ascended and went back to the Father in heaven, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens that he might fill or fulfill all things. What are the gifts that he gave? He gave gifts unto men. 11th verse, and he tells you. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Notice this. For, now watch, when did, when... When did Jesus give these apostles? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. When did he do this? After he ascended. Well, if that's true, then these kind of apostles never existed before. They weren't one of the 12. Hello. 
They weren't foundation apostles. They are what we call ascension gifts apostles. These are the ones that Jesus gave to the church. Amen. After he went to heaven and he gave it for this purpose, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, that is the building up of the body of Christ. The perfecting my job, his job, her job, their job is to, it says perfecting here, it means for the maturing and for the outfitting of the work of the ministry. Wow, what's that? That means that the body of Christ has a ministry. You have a ministry. And the only way you'll ever find out what that ministry is and how to be equipped for it is when you are submitted to and subjected to apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why is the church so immature today and are, are accepting all, time, all kinds of ungodliness into the church are you listening to? Why is the church today allowing the world to come in and to detect or direct their, their direction? Why? Well, because they only believe in pastors, evangelists, and teachers. They totally ignore these two foundational gifts, which are the apostles and prophets. They work together. Amen. To mature. That is to equip the saints. You cannot fulfill your destiny to the fullest until you grow up. That's what this church is all about, is growing the saints. Transformation. Going from glory to glory. Paul said, I would pr uh, declare every, per every person, every member of the body perfect, that is mature. That was his ministry. Are you listening to me? Amen. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. See, when, when people are doing the work of the ministry, the body of Christ is edified. It's built up. Till or until, that's that other word. That's that other word. When were these gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, when were they given to the church? When Jesus ascended, how long then are we going to have them? Because they say that that's been done away with. Religion says there are no apostles and prophets of day. It's been away with. It's been done away with. That it all died when all the apostles died out. The, the lambs, the lamb of the apostles of the lamb. When they died out, no more apostles, no more prophets. But there's a problem. It says until. When and until. In other words, I want to know, was it done away with? Well, it says here, until we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, that's a mature man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Till. Till. Till we all grow up. Till we're all equipped. Have you ever seen that? I've never seen that. But we're working toward that. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Now, I don't really know if he's talking about the church coming from maturity here, but there is going to be a time when we do, even if it's after this life. Hello? Either way, either way, it's till. And till is not here yet. So we need these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, these, these gifts. They're gifts. Until. They haven't been done away with. They couldn't be done away with. If they were, then you could never, ever grow up. Amen. And most people remain babies their whole Christian walk. Anybody know any baby Christians? I know you do. But I know you wouldn't be one. Are you beginning to see that 
if you slip up at the dinner table at Thanksgiving and say, well, Apostle David said this, you're in trouble. <laughs> because your religious kinfolk can't stand that word because they don't understand it. The reason they don't understand it is because they've never been taught. You see why this is an apostolic church? No other church in this part of the world has ever taught this. There's, matter of fact, I have never seen a church in this part of the world that was committed to the perfecting of the saints. The message of this house is different. God didn't call me. He, he, he worked on me for years, honey. You don't get up one morning and become an apostle. You have to go through hell and high water. And you don't start out there. You, notice here that Paul and Barnabas, they didn't start out as apostles. They started out as teachers or prophets or both until they were sent. Am I doing okay? Now, when and until. Don't forget those two words because that's, that's key to this, uh, this understanding the apostolic and the uh, apostle. All right. What do apostles do? And let, me, let me say this. Now, now I can say it. Our pattern for the New Testament church, that's what he told me, is in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we find the Apostle Paul. Now, he wasn't one of the twelve. He was an ascension gift apostle. See, because when he came, he became an apostle after Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended. So he is a good example for apostles today. And also, he is an apostle to the Gentiles. We got any Gentiles in the house. So then I study the life of Paul and I find out that he is a good example of the gifts of apostle that we have today. Amen. Amen. Apostles, what do apostles do? What is their ministry about? In 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 10, it says, Paul says to the church at Corinth, I have planted, apostles plant. Did you know Paul said this? He said, I never built on another man's foundation. All the churches that he started wasn't sent to him by the Baptist committee. I, I worked for a man one time. He was Church of God. And so they, he, they decided they didn't like the pastor that they had. See, what happens in the traditional church, if people don't like the pastor, amen, they get a new pastor. In the apostolic church, if you don't like the apostle or what he's preaching, you leave. But he ain't, he ain't leaving because he's been sent by God. He don't get to choose where he goes. Apostles have a certain territory and a certain kind of people that they're called to minister to. Sorry to say you want them people. He said, I have planted and Apollos watered. The people in the church at Corinth were saying, well, I'm following Apollos. And the others say, well, I'm following Paul. No, Paul's trying to straighten them out. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gave the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth 
are one. The, the Apollos was a teacher. He was, so, so you got to have teachers in the church. Hello. They're one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are labors together with Christ, and ye are God's husbandry, you are God's garden. Ye are God's building, building, according to the grace of God which was given unto me, Paul said, as a wise master builder. That comes from the word architectron, and that's where we get the English word architect. Paul says, I am a master architect. He says, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. Apostles first are builders. They're always first. Every time you see a word apostle and prophets together, it's always apostles first. He said some in the church, I'll read that scripture in a moment, I guess. He said some in the church first, apostles. Hello? They are builders. What do they build? Well, they build churches. They build not just not buildings, people. The people are the church. They build church. They build a group of people, a congregation. Amen. A, a, a local family. That's what they build. They build schools. Paul taught in a school for about two years. They build daycares. They build academies. Hello? Hello? You know what I want to see? I've been wanting it for years and years and years, and I see no way, and maybe it won't happen in my lifetime, but I want to see a Bible school. I want to see a Bible school. I can't have a Bible school now because I don't know of anybody that's that hungry for the Word. Hello out there. But it's in my heart. But they're builders. And they lay the foundation, and the foundation is Jesus. Amen. Apostles, prophets. What are two words best explain the ministry of the prophet? That is to see and to know. Prophets look into the realm of the Spirit. They have an ability to see things through the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits. I won't, I'm not teaching on those gifts. That goes with the ministry of the prophet. But basically what it means is they have the ability to know things in the past supernaturally. How many knows that we don't know what our history, this nation, is because human beings wrote history the way they saw it? the way they perceived it. So you don't know, and boy, the government keeps you from knowing a lot of things. They don't want you to know a lot of things. They don't talk about a lot of things. Hello? They won't tell you anything about how we invaded this land and ran the, 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 the Native Americans out and stuck them on a reservation somewhere and try to starve and give them a bunch of liquor and starve them to death. They won't, they won't, you know, they've mentioned, I, I, I never heard that in school. I never, nobody ever talks about that. But see, a prophet comes along and lets you know what has been and what you need to repent of. And they show you the truth about the past, your past. I look back, I've seen Back, I, 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 oh, I understand now. I didn't see that at the time. Anybody ever been there? They also see into the realm of the Spirit, and they see what's going on right now. They have an ability to see what's going on behind the scenes. Number three, they can see and discern, that is, discern 
spirits, whether they're good or they're bad. Andy was talking about the holiday spirit. <laughs> well, a prophet can look at that. I mean, it's a feel-good spirit until after January the 1st. But they can see into it, and they can see whether it's a good spirit or the bad spirit. Now, it means different things to different people. You understand what I'm saying? But discerning of spirits means that you're able to look into the spirit realm and really know what's going on in the realm of the spirit. You can look at, uh, they can see angels. Not all the time, but as the spirit wills. They can see angels. There's angels in here right now, but, but you can't see them unless you have, unless you're prophetic. Now listen, let me clear this up. Paul said you can all prophesy. Everybody in here can prophesy, but not everybody's a prophet. Because the simple gift of prophecy is this, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Everybody can do that. But only prophets have that ability to see into the realm of the Spirit and tell you what's going to happen and what's going on and what has happened in the past. Am I doing all right? The ministry of the evangelist. The two words that really stand out for the ministry of the evangelist is concerned, they are, their ministry is to save and to heal. Philip was an evangelist. Acts 5, 8, 5 say, and they preached Christ. That is good news. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Evangelists are preachers. They're preachers. They usually, they don't, unless they've got a teaching gift as well, the simple gift of the evangelist is that they share the good news. They preach Jesus. Okay? They're preachers. And if you read in Acts chapter 8, they, they cast out devils. They heal the sick. Amen. And they're limited. If you read that, you'll find out that there was a man down there in Samaria who was a sorcerer. Are you listening to me? And they, didn't, they couldn't deal with him. They were just, uh, Philip was, just, uh, was, was an evangelist. That wasn't really uh, the ministry that he had. But when Peter and John came down there, they recognized him and recognized the spirit that went on him and cast that thing out of him. Hello. See, all of these, all these ministry gifts have certain functions. Many of them are the same, but then there are differences. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Do you know the word pastors here? Is, that's the only time it's ever mentioned in the New Testament. But it means shepherd. So that ministry, the word, the word pastors is only used one time. But it's referred to many times as shepherds. Well, what do they do? They care for the sheep. They nurture, they protect, they feed. Uh, the, the word pastor is also used uh, in the New Testament just one time. Now, when it talks about caring for the sheep and nurturing the sheep, being there for the sheep, hello out there, when they're caring for the sheep, that has to do, you can see how that would have to do with marrying and burying and dedicating, hello, amen. And then teachers. What is the ministry of the teacher? Teachers don't necessarily preach. They expand and they explain. Teachers take the revelation of the apostles, the prophets, the vision that God gives the house, and they explain it from the scriptures. They love to study. Now, listen, why do you need to know? Why do you need to know about these gifts? Because all of these gifts have something to impart to you. They all have something to give you. 
All of them have something a little different for you that you need to fulfill your purpose and your destiny. But, you know, here's, here's, here was my problem when the Lord told me I was an apostle. And I, it wasn't just, it was confirmed by, where did I write it down? It was confirmed by one, two, three, four, five, six, six different reputable elders in the body of Christ. It was confirmed. Amen. In other words, I just didn't wake up one morning. I'm, a, I'm an apostle. No, it had to be, it had to be confirmed. Amen. Every ministry gift needs to be confirmed by presbytery, by the elders of the church. Okay? Uh, so they all have something to give that you need. But what was going on with me is I started out, well, I started out as an, uh, uh, an evangelist slash prophet. And I itinerated. I went from church to church. I didn't pastor a church or anything. Then God put me in a church as a pastor. And I stood in that office and I pastored the people as best I could. But here's the thing. I didn't fit the mold just right. I was always different. Uh, and, 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 and this is the problem with that. The more I moved into the apostolic ministry, the more I didn't just fit as a pastor. And yet, people not knowing the difference in the gifts, they were trying to draw their gifts, the gift of the pastor. They, they, they were used to pastors. That's all anybody knows in this part of the world. So they picture what a pastor is, and that's all they know to draw from him is the pastoral anointing. But if you know, if you know a person is an apostle, you can draw that anointing from them. They impart. They give you something you need. If you're, if you, if, you know, if you don't know the gift, then how are you going to draw from the gift? You'll be drawing from one thing, and, the, and, 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 and if you're trying to make a, a, a pastor an apostle, then you're going you, to hurt him. Mm -hmm. uh, am I doing all right? Am I saying it right? You have to recognize the anointing because all of these have a call, a divine call. You don't just decide to be one. Bless their darling heart. I had a lady came from Australia. She had a little Bible study in Australia. She came all the way from Australia to a conference I was in wanting somebody to confirm to her that she was an apostle. Honey, you just got a little, you, you ain't been saved for a little while. You got a little prayer study, a little Bible study, and you, you don't, you want to be a, a, an apostle? To anybody who wants to be an apostle is crazy. They need help. You don't know what's involved in it. You have no idea what it costs. Can I just say this? The devil hates this ministry, hates the ministry of the apostle more and fears it more than anything, any of these other gifts. Hello? Y'all been around here a while. You know, those that have uh, been around here a while, uh, have I ever been through anything? Now here is... Uh, I want you to see something. Jesus operated in all of these gifts. He was an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, and a pastor and a teacher. We know he was an apostle, Hebrews 3, 1, I've already repeated. He was an apostle and high priest of our faith. 
Then in Mark 6, 4, it says that he was a prophet. Jesus said in his own country, a prophet is without honor in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. He was talking about himself. You see? He was an evangelist in Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The gospel is good news. The evangel is a good news. An evangelist shares the good news of the gospel. This was Jesus. Gospel to the poor sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at them that are liberty, them that are bruised. He was a pastor. John ten fourteen. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. He's a good shepherd. He's a pastor. He was a teacher. In John 3, 2, it says, the same, that's talking about Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Hello? So Jesus, were, he was all of these things. See, he had, the, he had the spirit without measure. We have the spirit by measure. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, this is said, And God has set in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, listen, thirdly teachers, after that. Everybody say after that. After that, after that gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Why don't we have the healings and the helps and the governments and diversities to the level that they did in the New Testament? Well, let me tell you why. Because we don't have first apostles, secondarily prophets, and thirdly teachers. Anybody here? Now, you better grab a hold of your seat. It's going to be hard staying here when you find this out now. We're finishing up right here. There was no such thing in the New Testament as a pastoral church or a prophetic church or any denominational church. The only kind of church, talking about the pattern of the New Testament church, well, the churches today couldn't be fit in the pattern. They couldn't be. If they don't, if they don't have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, these gifts, if they don't, if they don't have the miracles and the healings and deliverances, the only kind of church in the New Testament is an apostolic church. It means that they are overseen by an apostle. Either an apostle started the church or there was apostolic oversight. When the apostles heard that there was a revival down in Samaria, guess what? The apostles went down there to oversee that thing and make sure it was in order. When there was a, a church that was started because of the persecution in Jerusalem, they went down to Antioch. Some people went down to Antioch and started a church. And as soon as the news reached Jerusalem, what did they do? They sent an apostle down there to make sure it was in apostolic order. Apostles set things in order. You have different kinds of government. And boy, this is well hated here. You have the congregational government, and that's where everybody gets to vote on things. If that's true, I'd have got voted out a long time ago, I guess. Then you have the Presbyterian uh, government. And that means that you've got a, a board of elders and they've got equal authority with a pastor. I don't know how that would work because like to me, it'd be a fight all the time. 
But then in the apostolic church, the apostle has the authority. You see what I'm saying? Why? Because they were the first one there. They built. Hello? So, and when, so when you begin to talk about, I've heard, oh, I used to have a barber that cut my hair sometime. And he would talk about people like me. I know so-and-so, he went over there and started the church, and he's got the authority in that church. He can just do anything he wants to do. Did you know you vote every Sunday? You vote every Sunday because how do you vote? By showing up. I'll ask you this. Am I a dictator? I don't force anything. I, you know, uh, authority without re responsibility is a dictatorship. Amen. But he has to have leadership abilities and he has to have vision. When they are sent to another nation, to defeat that nation and set up the government of the nation that sent them, they've got to see it. There's got to be a decision. You know why? There's got to be a purpose. Do you know why we've lost the last two or three wars? Well, I don't think we've won a war since uh, World War II. Vietnam, Afghanistan, I don't know a whole lot about the Korean War, but I knew about those, and I know this, because my, my grandson was over there, and they don't know why they were there. I don't know why they were there. And so we just went over to Vietnam and got 52,000 young men killed and just went back home. Same thing in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Had no business over there. Hello? Didn't have a vision. See, they didn't have a vision. If you have a vision, you've got to know why the vision is there, why the vision is important. What is the purpose of the vision? Amen? Because we, if, 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 if you don't have a vision, you can't lead. If an apostle doesn't have a vision, he can't, a vision, he can't lead anybody into that vision. If he doesn't know where the church is going, hello out there. <laughs> then he won't know when he gets there. Hallelujah. Did y'all get anything out of this? Well, I tried. Did much. That's, all I, that's all I got. Was that all right? All right. Y'all come and sing. Thank you, Jesus. God's about to do some things. He's already done some things. Because, see, the, the new folks that's coming into this church, they don't know anything about this, and they, don't, they can't answer anybody. Right. Amen. And, and sooner or later, somebody is going to tell you that you're crazy yeah. because you go to an apostolic church, and you've got an apostle. And uh, I've been, listen. Folk have gotten mad and sideways and left and said, he's a one-man show. He's a one-man. I've heard that so many, a one-man show. Would you define that for me? You're a very intelligent person. What is a one-man show? When one man does everything? I guess. See, in a, listen, the mindset around here is that the pastor does all the work of the ministry. An apostle doesn't do that. He equips the people to do the work of the ministry. Amen? So it's not that, so that they expect the pastor to do everything. They expect the pastor to work six days a week for nothing. Very little. They want him to, they want him to bury the dead, marry, uh, dedicate babies. Hello. Uh, shake all the, uh, kiss all the babies on the way out. 
You know, I, they all stand at the back door and greet everybody when they go out. I used to do that. But see, the ministry that, that the apostle had, <clears throat> people talk ugly to you on the way out the door. I decided if I'm going to be talked ugly to, it's not going to be by anybody other than Geraldine, you know. Because <laughs> I don't deal with that very well, you know. But, but there's a difference. And let me tell you this. See, please, please, please don't go out of here thinking I'm critical. I'm telling you up front. You know what? I might not. I probably wouldn't be saved today. If, what, if it wasn't for the Franklin Springs Baptist Church. Every church has, every apostle has their assignment. Mm -hmm. they're, they're different, they're, they're, they're the same in so many areas, but they're different as far as their assignment is concerned. Hello? And so churches are, most every church, if it's a God church, then they have some kind of forte. There's something that they're better at than anything else. And, and many of the churches are, are great on salvation. But at the same time, that's as far as they can take them. A lot of churches do not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence speaking in tongues. They say that's been the way done away with. Are y'all listening to me? So I'm not being critical of anybody because everybody has their part. I thank God for anything that anybody else does that helps the kingdom. But I'm telling you that as a sent one, we have a, a, a direction. This here, this church is here to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints and provide an opportunity for God's people to be transformed into effective disciples for the kingdom of God. To establish apostolic model church of all places in Carnesville, Georgia. But yet, the word that goes out of here, you know, John and Sandy, they come from time to time. They have a church. But let me tell you something. They broke tradition because they don't have church on Sunday morning. They have their church on Sunday night. I think that's cool, man. I thank God that they were they were apostolic enough because of their teaching and training that they didn't have to follow everybody else's pattern. And yet they're effective. Amen. 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 Praise God. All right. Let's stand. We're gonna we're gonna they're gonna sing. What are y'all gonna sing? Let me see.